Well, hello and welcome to another amazing guest interview here on the Profit With Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I have a treat for you. Why? Because, well, currently, at the time of this recording, uh, staffing seems to be a big issue here in the United States of America, uh, simply because of... Um, bloated finances and in the economy, uh, all of a sudden, everybody's demanding a lot of money for their work. Uh, prices are going up, there's inflation going through the roof, and people are struggling to find good people. And that is a problem. It's a problem for everybody out there. It's a problem for the restaurants you go to. It's a problem for the supermarkets you shop in, but it's also a problem for our law firms because um, they're all telling me, it's hard to find good staff. And when you think you find somebody good, you get a millennial who's too lazy to actually show up to work or decides they want to take Mondays and Fridays off and they want to come in virtually twice a week. So they're basically in the office once a week, uh, all kinds of weird, funny stuff going on like that. And who better to have a conversation around what we can do uh, to assist us in moving the needle forward in our business than our guest today, who is uh, Randa Prendergast. And Randa is known as the attorney whisperer. And we're going to hopefully jump into that and understand how she became the attorney whisperer. Uh, but she is entrenched in the business of assistance law firms and managing their law office. She helps attorneys free up their time by focusing on inefficiencies in their workflows, policies and procedures, time management, and um, the biggest one that caught my attention, offering paralegal support, helping you to find the paralegals that are right fit for your business and keep your legal work moving forward. Randa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited it to be here. It's my pleasure, and uh, I'm excited to have you. Uh, actually, found out about you through uh, Jordan Ostroff, who I, I think that you uh, might have been on his show, um, yeah. Exhibit A Attorney. Uh, Exhibit A Attorney. Um, so, uh, Jordan's a, a fast, good friend, a, a recent acquaintance in the past couple of years, but really an, an amazing individual. Um, and uh, when when he shared about his experience with you, I said, okay, let's reach out and get to know, get to know Randa for ourselves and um, get you on the show. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, let's jump in with the easiest question of all, because it's the most sure. well known to you. And that is just tell us a little bit about yourself, because our listeners, many of them probably never heard of you. Um, mm -hmm. And just share us share with us your story, how you ended up doing what you're doing. Um, you know, what what got you there? Uh, and we'll try to keep it, you know, under an hour so we can get to some other topics of conversation. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I have been in the legal field since 2007. I started in a solo firm, a family law firm. Um, I was in college at the time, just getting ready to graduate. Um, so I wore many hats within the solo firm and was really entrenched with the ins and outs of how to run a law firm. Um, so not only was I the paralegal, I was the legal secretary, the billing clerk, um, collections, everything in between. Um, so I started there. Then I moved into just the civil lit and collections firm. Um, wasn't really my cup of tea. However, I did learn a lot about litigation in general, which gave me a really good foundation um, to move forward. So I ended up growing my family. So I decided to stay home and I still wanted to be involved with the legal field. So I was doing contract work um, with, way before the pandemic and remote work was really a thing. So probably like eight, nine years ago, um, I would contract with attorneys on a remote basis. Uh, typically people I just had already worked for in the past. Um, I then had a business partner to do the paralegal support exclusively uh, together. Um, learned a lot. You know, I can I can paralegal. I know how to run a law firm, but owning a business is a whole nother beast. And um, so having that experience of owning my own business has been helpful too to guiding law firms. Um, eventually, I started with and um, I am still with um, a company called Streamlined Legal. They do, um, they set up and customize your Clio and your Clio Manage. Melanie Lennard is the owner of that. And I am their task list 
extraordinaire. I build all the task lists and workflow for law firms. So um, I felt at some point there was a need for solos and small firms to identify inefficiencies in their law firm and to also get some actual legal support because they are one person. They can't possibly do it all and nor should they do it all. So um, working with Melanie has taught me, you know, there's so much need outside of just um, setting up their personal systems within a software, but other needs of like being consistent with billing or um, even being consistent with using a timer uh, to capture your time to do billing, um, you know, showing law firms where they should hire. Maybe they shouldn't hire the person right out of school because they're going to spend a lot of time training them. And um, to invest that much time, too, for them to leave is also a big loss for that solo firm who's trying to hold on to every dollar at some point. So um, I thought, hey, I love working with paralegals. And um, I love that work, but I also love the system. So why not, you know, offer senior level paralegals to solo and small firms? So uh, that's what we do. That's our main focus is to provide that legal support um, to law firms. Most times when we talk with them, we realize there's some inefficiencies within their firms or they don't know what they don't know. They went to law school, they know how to practice law, but they're not 100% certain on how to run a law firm. So we step in there. It's really unique situation. Um, we have the paralegal pushing the legal files forward. So the attorney can pause and start focusing on their business. I love that. And um, interestingly, it's a small world. So I don't know how come our paths never crossed before because Melanie and I um, have done a lot of work together. Uh, Melanie, myself and Mark Homer partnered yeah. together to create the Law Firm Growth Incubator. Uh, we ran that from when COVID first, kick, first started back in um, May, uh, April of 2020 is when we, mm -hmm. when we kicked it off. Uh, and we just shut the doors to that um, the end, the last quarter of 2021. Um, so that was a great experience. And, and uh, I've had a, a, a lot of interaction with her. Uh, she does some amazing work with getting uh, law firms set up with technology yeah. solutions. Um, and uh, good to know that uh, there's you're the taskmaster behind behind the behind the scenes there. Uh, so the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. Uh, she also has been a speaker for us at um, in, on multiple occasions at multiple uh, events of ours. But we run the Law Firm Growth Summit, uh, the largest virtual conference for law firm owners. And uh, she she was a speaker at both our first and um, and our second conference, and probably will continue to be so moving forward. Uh, just a, a dynamic individual who really knows her stuff. Um, so, but it, very interestingly, your path took you through this, you know, and, and it's it's really when we look at somebody who started a business and they're using their expertise, it's amazing how these little pieces of of uh, experience all collectively add together to create a complete package. And um, you you had experience in different areas of law uh, to to at least open your eyes and understand what are the, the things that uh, a typical law firm owner would be struggling with. And um, what I hear from, from what you shared so far is that task management, time management, and being able to focus on some of the legal work that needs to get done um, without needing to get involved in all the nitty gritty details of getting that legal work done uh, is part of the challenges that the typical um, uh, firm owner has. Now, at what point or at what level of staffing do you think that the firm owner has exited from that list of challenges and entered a new one? Um, and tip, I, I, it's, it's obvious that somebody who's a solo would struggle with these things because there's no other attorney to hand work off to. Uh, and if you haven't effectively put a paralegal in place, um, then you don't even have that uh, paralegal moving the legal work forward as you describe it. Um, but at some point, staffing becomes full enough that the firm owner doesn't need to be busy with those things. What, what level do you think that is? In other words, where is the end of the spectrum of, of where um, your services might 
be needed in, in a typical law firm? Sure. So I've, I kind of tried to build our consulting model to like, I work myself out of a job mm -hmm. um, where we set them up well enough that they, they are running like a well-oiled machine. Like they have their processes in place. They're consistent in billing. Um, typically what happens is the law firm owner says, great, we've done all these things. I'm, I'm set up to um, grow my team so I can go to take a, a tip from Facebook lawyer on the beach. You know, I can go and be that lawyer that's away from my firm and everything's set up and I know everything's great. Um, or it's their opportunity to say, okay, I want to grow way beyond, you know, what we are right now. So they shift their focus on marketing and still not necessarily the legal work. Um, I thought at some point I would be working myself out of a job for the consulting piece. But what has happened is um, I also just hold you know, attorneys and lawyers accountable. So if they have these big goals, some of that accountability is, okay, what is our roadmap to get to that, you know, big goal? Um, maybe it's finding a, a legal coach who um, plans out, this is what you need to do to get to this goal. And so I hold them accountable to all that homework in between. Um, maybe it's just assisting and being that kind of case manager and checking in with the team while they are on the beach being, being that lawyer on the beach. So, um, at some point we haven't reached it yet. Um, I would think they would want to hire, um, and grow their team much bigger. Um, but honestly, we're not there yet. So I, I don't know what happens at that point. And that's okay. Um, we serve a purpose for a season of time. And um, if it just doesn't go beyond that, that's fine too. Yeah, I, lo I, I love that. And and really you, what you're saying is, is there's no end because there's always new stuff that comes up. There's always help that, uh, that a law firm is going to need. Um, so uh, very interesting um, that you're constantly trying to get them to be where they don't need you anymore. But the more that, that, that you do a good job at that, the more opportunity it creates for you to be involved in, in helping them move, uh, you know, push their agenda forward, which is wonderful. It means they're getting results. It means that whatever you're doing is working. Um, so kudos to you for, you know, for, for answering that call and, and being in that spot where a lot of people struggle with, uh, you know, even if you, if somebody comes into my world, we do, um, you know, primarily coaching for law firm owners. Um, and, and we might talk about how, okay, now you need to focus on creating processes. You need to focus on your systems so that everybody's doing the same thing so that clients are getting the same result. But we're not sitting there with the how-tos and the step-by-steps, right. right? They kind of need to go and figure that out. Um, and you're doing that. You're, you're, you're doing the how-tos for them. You're implementing that for them, which uh, for a lot of people, it's a, that's a huge service because even though they know they need to do it, they don't know how to do it. They don't know where to start. And it's not necessarily the best use of the, of the attorney's time. Uh, um, often we have our clients hire an assistant, get, you know, teach them step-by-step, process-by-process, and then have the assistant create the processes, create the task, the task list so that anybody in the future can follow it um, because it really doesn't make sense for the attorney to be busy with that. Uh, your solution is a perfect one as well. Now, when it comes to um, processes and task lists, I, I, I kind of think that those two are two different things, right? Somebody can create a process for something, but then there's like a step-by-step -step task that has to happen. Um, can you speak to the difference between those two? And what specific tools do you usually recommend for your clients to use to implement that? Sure. So I've done a lot of processes and task lists across different areas of law, especially working with Streamline Legal. So uh, the basics or let's say generic steps are kind of already there. I already start with those. So typically what happens is I just meet 
with the law firm owner and we start talking about what makes your process different. What are you doing differently? And I might offer some variations um, on how they could complete stuff. And they say, oh, yeah, we do it that way. Or no, this is slightly different. But within each task list or workflow is going to be um, what we call an internal policy or procedure or a process. So maybe we have a process or a workflow regarding um, responding to discovery. But within that, we need to have a process on, well, how do we process discovery that comes in, right? Like these are the steps that we have to take. We need to collect the documentation from our client. We need to, um, you know, answer these questions with our client, review it, have the attorney review it, submit it to opposing. But during that whole time, we're collecting documents of all sorts. Like, how do we organize it to where it makes sense and we can easily identify if we're missing something? So that might be as soon as it comes in, um, you know, we we provide a process that as soon as discovery documents come in, we need to review them for completion, redact them, beat stamp them, and save it this way. Maybe that includes filling out the discovery log for our client or opposing. So there's a lot of in between small things that we are doing. So when we're ready for a trial, we already have everything organized and we're being, we're at that time being proactive instead of reactive. So um, there's definitely the task list of the, you know, this is the steps, but then there's most times an internal policy or procedure or process that goes along with it. Are there any areas of the, life cycle of the law firm that you don't get involved with? In other words, are you primarily focused on the legal work itself and you don't deal with intake? You don't deal with um, perhaps, uh, you know, billings, collections, customer service on the back end, you know, post uh, engagement? Um, or do you do everything from beginning to end? Um, so we do a little bit. I do offer billing clerk services. Um, because that's a lot of, that's typically a big pain point for solos is they're not getting their bills out and, uh, we, we want to get them paid, right? If they're mm-hmm. getting paid, they're happy. They can see the light at the end of the tunnel. They can grow their firm. So, um, on top of that, we give them best practices and then we say, Hey, we also have a billing clerk that, that can do the billing for you. So you don't have to worry about it. It's going on in the background. So, um, we will offer that. Um, typically if it's something like we will give best practices for things and help implement if it's something that Streamline Legal can do, because they have an extensive billing procedure, especially if they're in Clio, you know, um, billing and intake, I always suggest that they link up with Streamline Legal because they're going to build that out, not only in your case management software and your CRM, but they're going to give you a very, very, very detailed policy and procedure to go along with it. So um, we give best practices, but for a full detailed procedure, if they're in Clio, I definitely recommend Streamline Legal. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I I actually asked the question to kind of set you up for the next one. Um, and, And that is when you look at your typical law firm that comes in the door, what is the most common item that becomes like the first thing that you need to implement for them to create efficiencies for their firm? Or where is the place that most firm owners, when they, when you meet them, that is like the, the lowest fruit to be picked off that tree, the lowest hanging fruit to, to start to move the needle on their efficiency. Um, billing. Okay. (laughs) Typically they are, they are not billing. Yeah. So So let's dive into that for a moment, because I think this will be really helpful for some of our listeners who, especially those who might not be really killing it in the billing department, right? Um, Why do you think that they're not billing? Like, don't they realize that that's the way that money comes in? And if you don't bill, you don't get paid? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone realizes that. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I hate doing my billing. You Mm -hmm. know, I'm very, um, I do it because I recognize that it's, that's how my business is going to keep afloat and move forward. But it's just one of those things um, that becomes a big nuance. And especially if you think, especially if you could hire someone else to do it, but you just don't know who to hire or how to go about it. So um, 
billing is difficult in a couple ways. Some attorneys, especially if they are, you know, working on retainer hourly, have a hard time keeping their time. And mm-hmm. so it's helping teaching them and giving them tools for how to use their timer and their case management software. Um, because we talk about how much time are, and money are you leaving on the table because you're estimating or you're forgetting. But so we try to build good habits. I love the book Atomic Habits. I mm-hmm. use it a lot when we're yep, talking by James about Clear. Money. Absolutely. We'll link that up in the show notes, folks. Uh, if you want to go out and buy it, get it on Amazon, Kindle, uh, whatever it is. I think that uh, you're you're really onto something. And I when we when people struggle with doing something, we have to start to question why are they struggling with it, right? Do they struggle with the time entry because they don't know how to use the timer in Clio? Or is it because of something else? Like what is the the deeper um, issue with tracking the time? And I think that deep down, um, especially in the early stages of growing your law firm, you're afraid of the billing conversation with your client because that opens the door to a confrontational situation where they might question how much time you spent, or they might question how much time is being spent or how much they're paying for whatever it is that you're doing for them. And because you want to avoid that conversation, you you start to have bad habits up front where you're not tra- tracking your time. Um, and one of the things that... Um, that really, really helps is if you approach, if you approach this conversation, you, you look at billing your client as a service to them, not something that is, um, is detrimental to them. In other words, um, I'll, here, here's a, an example I'll give. Uh, if somebody is walking down the street and all of a sudden they clutch their chest they fall down and they collapse on the side of the road. EMS is called and their heart stopped and they need to be shocked back into rhythm. They have a massive blockage in their artery and they're rushed to the hospital. And when they get to the hospital, they tell them, we, we've got the doctor on call who just finished med school. He's here for a few hours and he's ready to do your heart surgery. Or we could transfer you to the number one heart center uh, about an hour away and get you the top cardiologist. You know, the doctor here, will, will, you know, he takes your insurance. It'll get you the, you know, the hundred dollar copay. If we transfer you to the city, it's going to be out of network and it's going to cost you $25,000. Which one do you want? Right. And most people, when it comes to their heart and their life, and this is, you know, they get one shot at this surgery, are going to spend the $25,000. Even if they don't have it, they'll find a way to come up with it. And they're going to go an hour away to the top cardiologist in the world rather than having somebody who just finished med school work on them, right? Absolutely. When you bill your clients, that act of billing them is the place where they view how good you are. Yep. And the more you charge, the better you are. Yep. So there is definitely a perception in pricing, right? And mm-hmm. We talk about that. We talk about imposter syndrome a lot. Um, We talk about the fact that your clients expect to get a bill from you. And actually, if you don't bill them, you might have more like clients that are angry at you getting a bill just whenever you feel like it than instead of getting something consistent where they know they can manage it too. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, all, all, all you have to do is put your, yourself in your client's shoes, make believe that you have to go to an attorney to get services. And you're basically signing a document that's giving them an open-ended check to spend as much money of yours as they want. And now they wait three months to send you a bill and there's hundreds of hours that have accrued and you had no idea. So you had no option along the way of saying, wait a second, I don't have enough money. I need to pull the plug or we need to pause this or I need to find a cheaper solution. Maybe we can... You know, how can we settle? Yeah, you know? exactly. Or settle, or uh, or I could share a portion of the settlement with you if it's a if it's that kind of of case, and we can get you know have a lower hourly rate. Um, all kinds of conversations can happen, but you never gave them the opportunity to do that. So, um, the other the other big thing is is cash flow is king when, especially in a small business. And I encourage like 
anybody who is struggling with cash flow or struggling with billing issues to change their billing cycle. For some reason, every attorney thinks their billing cycle should be once a month. There's no, no other do. business in the world bi-weekly. We that, do operates, that operates once a month. I'm going to go even crazier than that. So you said bi-weekly really? and I agree with yeah. you, right? But for somebody who is, who's having difficulty with time entries and having yeah. difficulty, because what happens is, is they're also having difficulty with retainer management, right? Yeah. So they take an initial $5,000 retainer. They use that retainer up. And maybe in the in the engagement contract or letter, it it basically says that at fifty percent we're going to replenish the retainer. Well, they'll run it dry to zero before they ask for a retainer replenishment. And what happens is is that's just done from a combination of one of two things: either because they're on a monthly billing cycle and they use it up during the month, so they don't even know they used it up until they bill, or they're afraid to ask for more money, which goes back to that initial conversation, right? Um, if you switch to billing every week, then you are monitoring that retainer at a much higher level than if you were going bi-weekly. You're also not going to forget how much time you spent on something when you're trying to recall because you didn't enter That's the time true. when yeah. it's within the last seven days, a lot better than if it was in the last 14 days. So when I'm trying to fix a broken system with somebody, I'll go to the other extreme. We're going to bill right. every week, like every Friday afternoon, you're going you to block your calendar at three o'clock and you're not leaving the office till you're done getting your bills out. And that's mm -hmm. how you close your week out. And what that does is, is it creates number one, it'll highlight how, how awful they are at the time entry during the week and really help them fix that because it creates a lot of pain when you need to recreate it at the end. And you're not even like, there's an ethical dilemma, right? Yeah. How do you, absolutely. how do you know you're billing your client the right amount of time? Right. If you didn't track it exactly. Yes. So yeah. all kinds of issues can get resolved by going to, to the other extreme. But I love that yeah. you're you're already on that page. You get them billing twice, you know, biweekly um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, if you look at any other business, right, you walk into a restaurant. Do you mm -hmm. put it on your tab when you leave or do you pay? Right. Right. You, you go to the doctor. Do they take a copay when you arrive or do they wait until the insurance, you know, goes through six weeks later to send you a bill? You look right. at any other business and any other professional service, anything else that's happening, go to your accountant. I'm a, I'm a tax accountant. Mm -hmm. I don't open, I don't, we don't start collecting somebody's tax documents until they've paid for their tax right. return in full. Now that's not how a lot of accountants operate. A lot of them will bill you before you sign your return, Sure. but they're going to bill you before the service is completed, mm -hmm. before it's finished being rendered. Yeah. This business of waiting a month to get to, to do your billing just doesn't make any sense. And right. it comes from big law, right? Because a lot of attorneys start out in a much larger law firm and then mm -hmm. they go out on their own. <clears throat> and in big law, they can afford to do it. They're not worried about the cash flow. They're not worried about the customer experience. They have the process that they follow. And then once a month, they have everybody go through and review their time entries and they do this mm -hmm. massive batch of billing and they take care of it. But you can afford to do that when you've got millions in the bank, you can't afford to do that when you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay your mortgage tomorrow. And right. that's where, you know, getting that billing on a regular cycle frequent is going mm -hmm. to not only help your customers, your clients, right. but it will help you, your cash flow, make your life easier and really highlight to you when you have a, a, a crappy week. Right. If you, you bill every Friday and you're getting two thousand yeah. dollars out on a Friday and then you have a Friday and you got four hundred bucks out. You're like, well, what was I doing this week? Right. So like in addition to the recommendation of biweekly billing, a lot of my clients, I have cash flow or money talks with them each week. Typically, it's on a Friday and we look at their billable hours for that week. So we may not say we're billing every week, but we do have those discussions. Like, look, Joe, you only had, you know, five billable hours this week. What happened? And then we start talking about, well, what got in the way? What was the distraction? And we, well, I did a lot of non-billable things. Well, what types of things are you doing? And we get deeper into, you know, we maybe we should start keeping time for those non-billables so you can see where you're spending your time and where you're being distracted. So there's a lot of layers to billing um, from being consistent, time entries, um, you know, imposter syndrome, all kinds of things that are layered into, uh, you know, billing. So we definitely, you know, 
dive right in and get to the root of what's causing it. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing is, is that when you are paying attention to those numbers, you're paying attention to those non-billable hours, it becomes mm-hmm. so easy for you to decide to bring on additional help. Because when you start to realize that by me doing my books and spending, you know, six hours on it this week, when a bookkeeper could have done it for, you know, taken them three hours for 20 bucks an hour, they could have got paid. Pay, I could have paid 60 bucks and had these six hours to bill at $300 an hour and had another $1,800 in billing. All of a sudden, the math starts to make sense to start to align other, you know, have other people doing those other tasks, which is really how businesses grow. It doesn't yeah. grow on your own sweat equity. Your own sweat equity is only, you know, then you're just replacing your your job. You're replacing a paycheck with another paycheck and, you know, you become your own boss. And that's basically it. If you want to grow a business to where it doesn't rely on you, mm-hmm. that's going to require Absolutely. hiring people. And um, I recently released a video on Facebook. It's currently at the time of this recording, it's running as, as you know, as a Facebook ad. Um, and it basically has uh, at the top. Um, uh, hire staff when you when you can't afford them, mm-hmm. and that's th- that's basically how it works. And I was trying to think of an analogy that I can use for that for that subject, and um, I you know I came up with one uh, today in the shower, of course. But that's where the best <laughs> ideas come up. Um, but if you think about your your law firm as a cup, right? The cup can only get filled so much, mm-hmm. and um, if it's filled to the top. And you try to put more in, you can potentially stack things on top, but you got to balance it and, you know, everything could just fall over. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what happens in your law firm. You have only so much capacity in your firm. It's a cup. And when you're at capacity, you can't add any more. So if you think you're going to solve the problem by adding more clients so that now you have enough money to pay for somebody, you can't add those clients. They literally can't stay there. You'll lose clients. Clients, they'll fall off and because you can't like, keep the balance. And, yeah, that's like and, a law firm insurance claim waiting to happen too, right? Yeah, well, that could be. Hopefully, you have yeah. insurance because if you're skimping out on people, you're probably skimping out on other costs, and maybe you don't. You're, you're not even getting yourself good malpractice insurance. But right. the point is, is that if you take that analogy, what's the what's the solution? Get a bigger cup. Go to a mm-hmm. bucket, right? Well, how do you do that in your law firm? You add people. When you add people, you increase capacity, you increase the ability to handle more clients. Those clients are waiting to come in. I can't tell you how many of my coaching clients have finally just taken my word for it on and hired somebody. And all of a sudden that person's fully booked. They're fully booked. And it's like within three, within 90 days that happens. And and they're like, holy crap, how did this happen? Because Mm -hmm. you have, you have a vessel that's just waiting for people to come in and it's just full. A, there's yeah. no room for them. Right. Yep. Um, it's amazing all the things that we talk about with law firms and then providing, you know, the paralegal support, how different their firm looks in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You know, it's sometimes like literally if they are ready for the work and to put in and follow direction, um, it's literally a 180. And it, those are that's why we do what we do. It's like the most exciting feeling in the world, as you know, as a coach to say, oh my gosh, I did all this and look at where we are right now, you know, and it renews their, you know, excitement to why they started their business in the first place. We always talk about that in our discovery calls. Why are you here? Like, why did you start your business? I think that you need to rethink or go back to that reason because that's often lost. And so I'm like a roadmap person. I'm a process person. So we think about why do why did we start this? And we start implementing things to get us back to that point. And so when they're at, sitting at 90 days and they have, and they're telling me, hey, next week I'm going on vacation with my family and I'm not taking my computer to work. You know, that's just the best feeling um, because that was the goal the entire time. And finally you're here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm curious if you can share like specific examples of what the numbers look like. So let's say a typical solo attorney comes into your, into your world. Uh, they don't have a paralegal, right? Mm-hmm. 
Um, what does their revenue look like? What does their profit look like? And then you help them implement a paralegal, implement the systems and processes. And then 90 days later, their law firm looks completely different. What does the revenue and the profit look like at that point? It's sometimes hard to judge revenue at that point just because billing so messed up. Mm -hmm. um, well, like that's part of the equation, right? No, yeah. the revenue was zero because they didn't bill in 90 days. That their profit like was negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sometimes there's negative. Sometimes revenues like under 10,000 for the month. Um, typically, they have their true solo. They have anywhere from 40 to 55 open matters. And um, if they bill, maybe... Um, you know, that maybe they're bringing in like eight to $12,000 a month. Um, within 90 days, we like to at least see that doubled. So, um, and, and sometimes it's more than that. Maybe sometimes it's tripled just because they're willing and able to put in the work. And so it's, you know, hit the ground running here are all the things you need to do they do them okay here what's the next step what's the next step right and they're excited and ready to go um especially if they are that excited about billing they get on board with that and we have our billing clerk working with them because that's consistency right there so um yeah so they typically double their revenue um within that 90 days so yeah, that's awesome. I, I And I, I think that that's I, I asked you for that information because I, I want to highlight to our listeners how powerful this is. Yeah. Like the, a, a little tweak. What is the little tweak? It doesn't seem so little, right? Oh, my gosh, I got to hire somebody. I got to take on a commitment of somebody's salary, their livelihood, their family is on my shoulders. Like they add all of this pressure to the decision. But literally at the end of the day, like the proof is in the pudding. Like, look at just let me tell you about all these other past clients that I have. And if you're willing to do the work within 90 days of hiring this person, you will have doubled your revenue. Do you think you can afford them now? Like if you believed me that that would happen, do you think you can afford them? And that's really what it is, is their belief in the end result. Believing yeah. that that's possible is what allows that to happen. Um, but ultimately it's, you gotta, you gotta buy in to this idea of, I gotta spend money to make money. Um, not in a, in a, um, uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for in a frivolous way, um, right. but in a very, um, specific planned, uh, you know, tactful way. The other thing is, is when somebody's thinking about hiring somebody, they think about the annual salary as the entire initial, um, burden that they're taking on themselves. So I'm going to hire somebody who's going to have a loaded salary of $60,000 and, I now have to make sure I have $60,000 in the bank or that I can come up with $60,000 if I need to. But no, you're they're they're getting a little over a thousand bucks a week. Yeah, well, and for right. us, so for us, um, since we, we are hourly 1099, so there's no other additional overhead for benefits or pay time off. You're not paying us to check our Facebook, to use the restroom. All of our time is billed time. 95% of our hours are billed straight to your client. And, you know, that's recouped through a paralegal, you know, rate, whatever you charge your client for your the paralegal rate. So your client's already paying our paralegal fee. Uh, I say 95. I reserve the other five because I'm gung-ho on you need to have a matter review or case review call every single week with your team member. So um, that other 5%, you know, we charge out at admin, but that is a cost to the law firm. It's not a large cost. It's an hour a week, but you know, we still hey, factor it's that one, in. it's one fortieth, right? If they're, if yeah, they're working okay. 40 hours, but, um, Sorry. yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's a really important point to make is, you know, especially if you're hiring a biller and, and the work is there, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. The place where 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 many firm owners probably struggle is I don't know if I have 40 hours for that person, right? And right. you're saying, well, you're not committing to 40 hours. You're committing to hiring them hourly and giving them the work that needs to be done. Let's see where what it is. Let's see where it goes. Uh, okay. you, maybe you need 20 to start. But chances yeah. are we put somebody in the door and they start taking stuff from you, the more stuff's going to come in. 
And Absolutely. they'll be doing 40 hours before you know it. Yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of people will say 40 hours. I, I think I need 40 hours. And I said, I don't think you need 40 hours. You just need someone who's really skilled in what they do. Good processes. And full time for us, because it's straight build time, is th around 30 to 32 hours. You know, so we're not even a full 40. And I'll say, I bet with a senior level paralegal and your process is in place, if you don't bring any other work in, they could do everything in about 20. Now, if you bring more work in, that's what's good. It is going to happen. Mm -hmm. More work is going to come in as soon as you start working with us. So we will have the bandwidth to include more hours. But typically, yeah, 20 hours with good processes is uh, where we start. Right. Now, the... Um... The paralegal that's coming in, I know this is, varies market to market, but they're paying right. hourly for them. What do they typically cost per hour when a senior level skilled paralegal? Uh, what does the law firm usually bill, uh, collect, uh, pay, I'm sorry, paying for their hourly rate? And then what are they typically able to bill them out for? Sure. So um, for Mrs. June Legal, we do hourly weekly packages. So you know, uh, the lower hours or higher rate. Um, we don't like to be a project based paralegal firm. So we like to get to know you and your law firm and support you in all ways that way. So um, that kind of prevents just the project based law firms that need work. So um, we start the higher end of $100 per hour would cost the law firm for the paralegal work. Typically, depending on where they're located, they can bill anywhere from 125 to 175 out for that paralegal rate to their client. Got it. Got it. Um, so and, and, and I think that part of the what you're looking at in the in the um, in the math of this equation is not necessarily what is the profit margin on the paralegals time. But right. it's really what is it making possible for the attorney to be able to handle now that Absolutely. we're getting those things that really shouldn't be on their plate off of their sure. plate? Um, because yeah. I, you, I, I can certainly see an attorney looking and saying, well, they're going to take stuff that I'm currently doing. So I'm currently billing my client 300 bucks an hour for, mm -hmm. for this work. Now they are doing it and I'm making 75 an hour on it because I'm making the difference between the 100, 175, for example. Uh, um, so I'm going to lose $225 an hour on the work I hand off to the paralegal. And I think it's really important to highlight that and say, and because there's somebody sitting there listening to this podcast Absolutely. and they're doing this math in their head, right? <laughs> uh, most people yeah. are not like me and they wouldn't have done this math in their head, but, but somebody is right. So let's no, talk I about it. Of, so, yeah. I think most people are probably going the direction you're talking about right now. Yeah. So and, and that's and that's really um, a negative way of thinking, and it's really going to hurt your ability to grow your business. But we do need to address it, right? Like, how do you navigate that conversation in your head um, mm -hmm. to recognize how much more potential you have um, to uh, that this is really not hurting you; it's really helping you. So I'm going to let you explain um, how this works and 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 how they can overcome it. Uh, and then I have a way that I explain it that if you don't cover it, I'll add it, add on to whatever you share. Sure. So um, I don't look at it or I explain to them, I don't look at it as them only having, you know, profit of $75. If my paralegal is doing that and they can also do that, I honestly look at it as a profit of $375 uh, for that one hour. If two people are doing the same thing on two different cases, right? And then also they have the opportunity to focus on marketing and networking that brings in more clients with them doing the paralegal, I'll say paralegal work because it's fit for a paralegal to do. With them doing the paralegal work, they don't have the opportunity to bring in any more clients. And we'll go back to your analogy of like the cup is too full. They physically have no more time in their day to do any more work. So it does. It's not going to be at the end of the road a result of higher profit if they're they don't have any more capacity. So um, we just kind of navigate and answer questions that way. Um, anyone who is 
at the end of their rope of having too much work, not enough time and their stress grasp that pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, and I like the, the way that you, I mean, that's one thing that I haven't done is, Hey, it's not $75 of profit an hour for that paralegals work. It's 375 because you're also getting an hour back of your time to do true legal work. The other thing that, um, that is not obvious in front and center is your client's not stupid. Your client's yeah. getting billed by you $300 an hour for work that a paralegal can do. And they can go to another law firm. And Absolutely. actually, even if the other law firm charges $600 an hour for the attorney, if the attorney is spending only two hours for every 10 on their stuff, and then the paralegal is doing the other eight hours, they're going to get a, a, a lower bill and perhaps maybe the other attorney is better than you, right? And you're sitting there trying to establish your name and figure out how do you, how do you build your, your practice and how do, you get, how do you attract clients? Clients are doing that math. They're sitting in on another conversation with another law firm where they're giving them a rate sheet that has an attorney rate and a paralegal rate, and they're getting one from you. Maybe it's got a paralegal rate, but they've never heard of the paralegal before. And they, you know, they know they're not working with a paralegal and they're wondering, where's that rate? either in the sales conversation or in the actual work, you know, working with you conversation. And if you're ignoring that, then you are hurting yourself because you're, you're just assuming that your client doesn't realize they realize, right, and uh, it's going to be hard for them to go and recommend you to a family member, to a friend when they feel taken advantage of. So yeah. there's, there's a hidden cost there that we're really not talking about, but it's really happening um, when, you, when you don't have those services available in your, in your law firm. But the last thing, the way that I, the analogy that I use or the way that I try to describe this to my clients is if you were to hire an attorney that is working full-time on legal work, they're not doing anything else, and you figure out what you, and whether you're charging hourly or whether you have a you know, a, a contingency based practice or whether you have a flat fee practice, figure out what that attorney would be able to bring in in revenue annually if they were fully booked. Mm -hmm. Right. And most people would get to a number somewhere between 600,000 and a million for an mm -hmm. attorney who's fully booked, working just on legal work, has all the support that they need. Right. Mm -hmm. Yet you, as a fully booked solo law firm owner, can't figure out how to get to 200,000 or 250, right? And why is that? It's because you're wearing so many different hats. It's because you're doing so many other things besides for the legal work. So right. when you start to realize that there's this gap between a full-time attorney and what I can accomplish, you got to mm -hmm. figure out how do I start to unlock that? How do I start to get myself closer to the 600,000 to a million mark or hire another attorney, right? One or the other. But right. you're not going to jump to hire an attorney if you haven't done everything to get as much off your plate as possible. You want to get the cheapest labor off your plate. And that's right. where I think when you start to compare yourself to what's possible, if you didn't have everything else that you were doing, all of a sudden it becomes very obvious that it's, it's completely holding you back. And Absolutely. you need to get support in place. You need to have somebody answering the phones. You don't have to hire a receptionist. You go to Smith AI. Um, yep. and folks, we, we promote Smith AI all the time. They're an awesome partner of ours. Um, they will answer your phone for you. They only bill you for the, for the, for the calls they take. Um, and it's a perfect solution. So you stop answering the phones. Um, mm -hmm. And what kind of message are you sending anyway, when you're the one answering the phones, when somebody calls your law firm? So go to Smith AI, it's profitwithlaw.com forward slash Smith AI. Uh, when you get there, You'll see the current promotions that we have available to you uh, to start off with them. There's always discounts available. I don't know what it is currently as I'm recording this because I just blurted it out. I don't have anything in front of me, but um, I, I'm, I'm telling you that they will take care of you. They will give you the right package for you. If you're just getting started, you just want to test the waters, tell them that you want something that's not listed. You want something that's smaller than what they have. See if they can create something for you. Usually they can. Um, but Hire, hire somebody to answer your phones. Hire somebody to do your bookkeeping. Uh, if you need a bookkeeper and you're trying to figure out where to go, go no further than Dream Builder Financial. We're a full service bookkeeping and accounting firm. 
uh, send an email to info at dreambuilderfinancial.com. We'll hook you up with a, with an initial call and and get you you know get you quoted out depending on your your needs and and get you started. But you shouldn't be doing your own bookkeeping. You shouldn't be doing your own customer service, customer support. Somebody should be doing that for you. You should be you shouldn't be doing your own paralegal work. Somebody should be doing that for you. So you can start to build out um, these roles, whether it's in person, whether it's virtual. There's so many options that you have, uh, whether it's offshore or onshore, uh, you know, staffing. Um, but literally today, you can have a fully staffed law firm and it costs you less than the price of one full-time person in your office. And if you start to marry these services together, it allows you to eliminate so much off of your plate, which now makes you free to go out and be that $600,000 attorney or that million dollar attorney. So when you start to look at the numbers like that, you got to, you got to, you got to get in touch with, with Randa and, you know, get her services in place. Like, what are you waiting for? All right, Randa, we're wrapping up here. We're at the end of, end of our time. We actually went a little over. I hope I didn't ask you if you had a hard stop. Hopefully you don't have to jump off this call this moment. Um, but I do want to close out with two things. One is, what is one parting piece of advice that you can leave with, with our listeners? And number two, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? Absolutely. So parting advice is um, look at your processes and start really focusing on what you can delegate out things that you don't absolutely have to do um, that will get the ball rolling. And um, hopefully, you know, you'll have the bright idea to get in contact with us so we can actually take those off your plate. Secondly, um, I don't have a website. I don't serve the general public. So I don't have a website for that reason. But you can find me on LinkedIn if you look up Attorney Whisper. I'm also on uh, Facebook. Um, or you can email us at admin at mrsjunelegal.com. Awesome. And folks, we'll link that up. We'll put the LinkedIn link in the show notes, um, as well as the, the email address that uh, Randa just shared. So everything will be there for your convenience right below this episode in the description, as well as on our website, profitwithlaw.com, where you can get the latest episodes. You can go in the search bar and search for somebody's name, search for a topic. You can easily find a past episode. We're well beyond 300 episodes at this point. Uh, we've talked about pr practically everything that you're going to run into. Um, and this is just an awesome conversation we just had with Randa. So it's a perfect example of what you can find in our repertoire of replays or, or past episodes. If you enjoyed this, uh, this particular podcast episode and you're new to this show, you want to make sure to hit the subscribe button or the follow button in your podcast player so that you get notified every time we release a new episode. Uh, we try to release episodes twice a week. Uh, I've been a little bit busy with a newborn here at home. He's now six months old, so he's not so newborn anymore, but um, it did throw off my game with my solo episodes on Tuesdays. Uh, but we have been bringing you consistently new um, interview episodes every Thursday, and I try to release a, a solo interview episode on Tuesdays. Um, hopefully, we'll get back on track with that. Uh, going into the summer, uh, it adds a new challenge because I like to take the summer off, go work at my kids' day camp and watch them in the wild, interacting with their friends. So uh, I'm going to be doing that again. I tried it last year and it was such a rewarding experience that I am, um, I'm going to do it again this summer. Um, so I'm super excited for that. Don't know what it's going to do for our podcast, but my team is working hard and heavy on really batching a ton of episodes beforehand so that you don't have a break in the cycle. Uh, but anyway, make sure that you're following the show. And if you've been listening to us for a while, or even if this is your first time and you really enjoyed the episode, uh, go leave us a rating and review. We really need those. We appreciate when you do that. Uh, if you don't have an iPhone, um, the best place for, for leaving ratings and reviews is the Apple Podcast directory. You can simply go to um, Apple Podcasts on, online and you can create yourself an account and you can leave a, a rating and review. It's a little bit of, of a couple extra steps if you do it that way. Thanks so much, folks, for joining us. We really appreciate having you here. And until next time, let's just focus on our profitability. Keep, keep that money home. Uh, don't spend it frivolously. And let's continue to grow our law firm to the point where we can have the life that we want, have the time that we want, have the family connections that we want, and, um, and the beach time that we want. Take care. Uh -huh.